Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali and I'm the events coordinator here at Bookstore Magic. Before we get started, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's going to go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end, so please start thinking of questions to ask. And after the talk tonight, Sloan will be signing and personalizing books at the desk behind me near the side door. We also have additional books available for purchase at the desk where you checked in. And of course, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of Cult Classic online using the link in the live stream description. All right, so with all that in mind, we are so very excited to introduce Sloan Crosley and Emma Straub, who are here celebrating the release of Sloan's latest novel, Cult Classic. Did the comic romantic thriller exist before Sloane Crosley, <laughs> or has she invented it? And he's right to wonder. Cult classic feels so refreshingly unique. This novel is laugh out loud funny with razor sharp wit, full of mysteries, absurdities, and scariest of all, ex-lovers. <laughs> so many of our booksellers had a blast reading this novel, as I'm sure many of you out there did as well. So we all can't wait to hear what more Sloane has to say about it tonight. Sloane Crosley is the author of the novel The Clasp and three essay collections, Look Alive Out There and the New York Times bestsellers I Was Told There'd Be Cake and How Did You Get This Number. A two-time finalist for the Thurber Prize for American Humor and a contributing editor at Vanity Fair, she lives here in New York City. And as I mentioned before, Emma Straub joins Sloane in conversation. Emma is the New York Times bestselling author of five novels, This Time Tomorrow, All Adults Here, the Vacationers, Modern Lovers, Laura Lamont's Life in Pictures, and the short story collection, Other People We Married. Her books have been published in 20 countries, and as I'm sure most of you know, she and her husband own Books on Magic, <laughs> an independent bookstore here in Brooklyn, New York. So without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sloan and Emma. to the store that you own. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> the commute was rough. But yeah, yeah, you got here. Yeah. But you don't live above the store. No, but I don't live far. <laughs> You're like, I'm not telling. Where do you live? <laughs> okay. Uh, That's fine. Social security number. <laughs> so what are you going to read to us, Sloan? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, um, I'm just going to read for a little bit because I think that most of you guys uh, came here to hear us chat. Um, but I'm going to read from something I haven't read from yet, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the novel, um, and it's sort of dead smack in the middle, as you can kind of see, which is sort of normally like a niche niche, because then you have to explain a lot, mm -hmm. which I'm not really going to do. But all you need to know, I think, is that our heroine Lola is um, about to go Google everyone she's ever dated. <laughs> I think that's all you need to know. Um, and you can put it together from context. Okay. Uh oh. Different. This is different. Competing bookstore. We support three lives. <laughs> <in this family. laughs> Don't forget. Okay. Okay. My whole life, I've been telling myself the story of every breakup so that I had more agency in it. Men do not like to entertain the idea that they have destroyed someone, and so they tend to behave as if they haven't. I granted them the delusion, forking it over without a fuss. Everyone wins. It's difficult to comfort oneself by shrinking one's emotions without conceding that one has allowed those emotions to expand unchecked in the first place. I found it easier to skip this process. But in truth, I'd been the victim of a metric ton of rejection. Already I could sense years of psychological work coming unglued as I searched for name after name, subjecting myself to condensed humiliation. I experience these men as no one is supposed to experience them, as if being propelled from a t-shirt gun. <laughs> it was like seeing every cigarette I ever smoked in one great big pile. <laughs> there were men whose dating profiles had read like the rules at a public pool. <laughs> no tattoos, no couch potatoes, no heavy drinkers, no picky eaters, and no taking oneself too seriously, no drama. <laughs> 
<laughs> Men who demanded a woman have a sense of humor but showed no signs of being funny. <laughs> Men who posted photos alongside striking female acquaintances, as if to say, just so you have a sense. <laughs> Men whose insecurities ran so deep they came out as accusations. How do you not have a boyfriend? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I went out with them anyway, these bouquets of red flags. <laughs> Curious as to how repulsively I'd have to behave in order to trigger a new decree. Knowing in advance, the answer would be not very. So many bloodless creatures who wanted all my blood, who offered nothing of themselves in return, who accused me of not opening up during the once every two weeks I was permitted to see them. <laughs> the needle of curiosity goes in, the traits are sent off to the lab, and the results are never to be shared. There were men who said that they wouldn't sleep with their ex-girlfriends for all the tea in China, but who turned out to be owning, running an import-export business to Beijing. <laughs> men who broke up with me because I was too good for them. Ah, but when do we send our food back to the kitchen because it's too delicious? <laughs> These were the same men who were always off to the gym, to the studio. The party was lame, the party was boring, you wouldn't have had any fun. Men who didn't think they were misogynists because they defended the actions of famous women, or famous minority women, or famous trans women, or famous, oh, no, that's it. <laughs> Men who said I reminded them of the girl who broke their heart in college or the one who cheated on them in grad school. Tuesday afternoon kind of wounds for every woman I knew in New York. Men who told me they would have to be dragged, kicking and screaming, out of this town, but now lived in Idaho. <laughs> Another woman had dragged them, but how? Low to the head? <laughs> Ether in a hand towel? Did she take the back roads? These were the same men who said they'd gone celibate for fear of hurting women, who thought they invented sadness, who told me I had no clue how dark things got in their heads, how dank the basements of their sorrow. Unrequited narcissists? These were men with a delicate sense of injustice when it came to their fellow man. Yes, life's a witch hunt. It will magnify your sins until they are grotesque canceling you from a program you didn't know you were on. Mm -hmm. But is that a broomstick between your thighs, or are you happy to see me? <laughs> These men were like tropical fish, easily stressed by too much communication or too little. <laughs> Some stared into my eyes, attempting tantric med meditation over martinis, telling me I was their soulmate after minute 10. <laughs> Some called me their girlfriend after date two. Some refused to call me their girlfriend after year one. Some <laughs> called me someone else's name. <laughs> There were younger men who were the same age as I was as I am now when they broke up with me. And did they feel the burn of shame at having made me feel old now that they were all caught up? Men who cut lines of powder with a jeweler's precision, a one-time thing, a two-time thing. But it's hard to pass off any activity as a 65-time thing. <laughs> men who'd hurt me more than once, but that was my fault. I wanted to touch the stove to see if it was still hot. It was still hot. <laughs> Men who made paper airplanes out of the customer copy while I signed the merchant one. Checks in the mail, hands on the thigh. Men whose texts I shown Vadi, this is her best friend, who gamely looked at the timestamps. Blue, I'm blue, we are all of us blue. <laughs> <laughs> Men who preferred missing me to being with me. Men who told me they were falling for me. It felt so good to say it, they'd figure out if they meant it later. <laughs> but when later came, they were not falling. But by God, they had tried. They detail their efforts to the court. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client has made reasonable attempts. He has gone to great pains. He has texted when he did not feel like it. He has listened when he was bored. He has written down the birthday. Those were the worst of all, worse than the cheaters and the sociopaths. Because as they stated their cases, they shook loose from the context in which I knew them. They were only people mired in downy confusion, born just a little bit broken, and trying to fix it. In all of history, we had landed in the same city at the same time, and to ladle miracle upon miracle, we had met. What were the odds? What were the chances? How could I not love them all just a little? You should do that one. Yeah. I love that. that was a hit. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad I got eight cities down. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else just got the note on the type. <laughs> um, okay, so one thing that I have learned on my book tour thus far is that most people are 
better at this than I am and don't have notes. Like, no one has notes. Sorry. I have notes, but I do. Okay, I have things yeah. written down, so it's fine. I so. would, you're trying to make creepy eye contact with me the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it. Um, okay, I love this book. I love this book. Um, and as I told Sloan, I listened to the audiobook, which Sloan reads. And I listened to it on the first part of my book tour when I was, I had spent a week in London and I was, so I was like walking around a city by myself, sort of jet lagged and therefore like sort of out of, like slightly out of sorts, um, which was perfect. <laughs> it was perfect. Um, because the book is, it has a very uncanny uncanny feeling and so right. I I just I loved it and so I my jills at tones yeah well yes she's very good as you can <laughs> as you can imagine from having her to read that section um okay so I want to start by talking about your voice not your actual voice but your voice on the page um because like you're you're very funny so thank you Sorry, is this news? <laughs> Sloan, you're funny. There's no way, there's no good way for me to respond. <laughs> no, I, so Sloan is famously funny. She's famously funny, and obviously what she just read was very funny. Um, but I, because you write both fiction and nonfiction, I found myself wondering as, as I was reading how if you, if you approach, if the way you approach the voice on the page changes depending on whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Yes. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Good? That's oh my god, well, good thing I'm <laughs> um, Yeah, no, I think that on a sort of micro level, no. Because there's only so many ways to say, um, yeah, I picked this up. Right. And you're going to say it the same way, you know, uh, in any sort of format. But the, the sort of intent for it is much different because, I mean, what I just read you could be, I guess, plucked out of anything, which is part of the reason why I read it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, usually it has to serve some higher purpose, i.e. to move some sort of narrative forward or some sort of characters forward. Otherwise, I think what happens is um, it's just sort of a mush of jokes, which is fine, but then you don't remember what you read, <laughs> and you can't recommend it to anyone else. You're like, I don't know what it's about. I just laughed a little bit, and then it stopped. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's fine, but and, and that's honestly shouldn't, the bar should be higher for essays as well, but essays end. That's what they do, quite short. Um, and if you're going to read, like, a two, three hundred page narrative, um, it is a little different to get the voice, to try to throw your voice a little bit more so that the characters sound different, so that you sound like you're in control. The yeah. reader knows that you're like not just sort of dancing monkey, but can really um, take you somewhere with the story. Yeah, yes. And and Lola, I just, I loved being with her. I loved being with her. I loved how... It's very messy. She is. She's messy. She is. She's messy, and and she doesn't always exactly tell the truth. Um, and I mean, she's just the person that you are always delighted to sit next to at, at any sort of um, function. Right. Like right. she will smoke a cigarette with you outside. Yeah. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. So delighted to get up with from any function. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But so I, I would love to sort of hear how she came to you, like, because her, her, and, and I want, to, I'm going to keep, try to keep this as spoiler free as, as possible. Um, but the light spoilers ahead, I will yeah. say, unless Sloan wants to go heavy spoilers ahead, that is her prerogative. They all get kidnapped by aliens. <laughs> I wasn't even gonna, I didn't even write the question down about the aliens. Um, but so how, so Lola's messiness, um, I think is part of the, it's, it's, it's part of the reason that the book works. Um, because she's sort of, uh, she's, 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 open to uh i'm trying it's hard not to do spoilers um so lola encounters m several of her ex-boyfriends um 
on the street in Manhattan, which happens, you know? <laughs> I bump into people all the time. Spoilers. <laughs> um, but can you talk to me just like a little bit about her and sort of how you, how you came to decide what kind of person she was and like um, in what various ways you wanted to uh, test her and torture her. And torture her, yeah. Um, okay, well, for those who have not read it, because it came out pretty recently, um, and I'll do, I'll do the, okay, I'll get, it. I'll get within an inch for that. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> um, basically, it's about a woman uh, who used to work for a magazine called um, Modern Psychology, uh, which is like the least creative part of the book. <laughs> it's so clearly psychology today. <laughs> what else could it be? You know, except it folds in the book. So, like, so hopefully that doesn't come to pass. Of the many things that happen in the book, hopefully yeah. that doesn't come yeah. to pass. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so her former boss has become this sort of like TV personality, kind of almost cult-like uh, wellness guru. Um, and uh, when she starts running into people, as you pointed out, it's, it's quite normal. Um, but then it happens successively, like it's met multiple times, and uh, it turns out that most of her ex-coworkers um, are sort of in on what is essentially a mind control cult that has been started by this former boss of hers. And okay, she's telling you. She's telling, I'm telling you. you. <laughs> it's fine, but this is fine. <laughs> this part is out there. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it, it's an abandoned uh, synagogue on the Lower East Side that he's gutted, and the way I describe it is like the like the lower half is graffiti, the top half is pigeon shit. It's like, you know, both species have come to an agreement. <laughs> and um, ser now this is the wild stop, you know, but basically because of some stuff that he's doing, if she steps within a five block radius of this building, uh, she's gonna have an unfortunate experience, <laughs> um, or possibly an unfortunate experience. Yeah. And meanwhile, she's uh, also in a serious relationship. So it's yeah. this sort of question. So your question of like where she came from. Yeah, or like, yeah, how did you, yeah, where'd you come well, from? Well, I think she came from, a lot of it was, um, it, the whole book came out of a serious amount of avoidance. You know, like it, it was said in the lovely introduction, you know, there's a lot of narrative nonfiction in my life. Um, and people sort of assume a lot of it is about dating when there's actually like two essays that are about romance at all, and there's like a hundred of them. Yeah. So I was like, honestly, I can curse on this, right? Yes. Fuck it. Like, fuck it. On this, on this chair. <laughs> this precious chair. <laughs> this is the chair. Um, but yeah, I just was like, oh, I'm so sick of um, avoiding this topic, but it's also a really hard topic, as you know, like, I mean, there's certain things, family, um, romance, the Civil War, <laughs> that, like, have just been written about all of them. Do you know what I mean? They're just like, like, you better, you better, like, you better have a good entry point, so that otherwise what's, you know, it's like, and so, I think I was just sort of, she came from me waiting, and in a way, I don't want to, like, um, undersell the book, um, <laughs> but I do feel like sometimes, Part of me thinks that she's almost not a hollow character, but she's just sort of. I consider her like when I think of her, I think of her as this like container for the friendships that are in the book. Which is, I mean, I hate to make it like, oh, it's about the friends we made along the way, but like there is a <laughs> lot of that in the book um, for this sort of skewering of wellness and tech culture, and then of course for this like, as I said, like t-shirt gun yeah. of ex-boyfriends that come through. And what's funny is I think I just, frankly, like. I don't know if I've put it this way before, but I just think I just sort of relied on like, you're supposed to be so strong and you're supposed to have, you know, obviously you know yourself, but at a certain point, like you are formed by the experiences you have. And I thought, well, if I just give her enough experience, you know, it's like, we're gonna shape her yeah. by propelling things at her. And so eventually the shape she has at the end is this sort of like warped. <laughs> <laughs> just cause she's been hit from so many angles. So she's just sort of like, warped, like I said, like turn the dial up on a sort of um, person who feels a little too old and doesn't necessarily know exactly who they are. Because I feel like everyone's had that experience, right? I mean, pop culture gives it to us, right? Where it's like, oh, your 20s are for figuring things out. <laughs> and I'm like, what the f <laughs> other decades for? <laughs> like, uh oh. <laughs> Oh, you haven't figured it out. Sloan. I mean, it's so embarrassing. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. 
Yeah, so I guess it's a weird roundabout, so I, I just wanted to give it a description of the book, but also, like, it's, I think she came from maybe just wanting to also create a character and a dynamic that was a little bit older, mm -hmm. so that, like, her dynamic with Clive, you know, he used to be her boss, so they have that sort of, like, mentor DNA, they have, like, old sexual tension DNA, they have friendship DNA, they have I'm gonna murder you DNA, <laughs> and that feels like a very real relationship where if they were younger, you'd be like, oh, are they gonna get together? Yeah. And I don't think that's remotely a question yeah. in the book. Yeah, yes, you know? yes, and, I, okay, there are no Sorry, more things that you just said that I so. want to go back to. Okay. okay, so, okay, so well, let's talk about Clive for a second, because I, so Clive is the boss who's the, yeah. who has gone on to be this sort of guru-y figure. Um, I loved their relationship because I felt like there would be like there would be so many ways to write that relationship that felt um, like oh here's somebody I'm putting on the shitty Neaman list you know like here's like <laughs> here's like a, a a a boss who has been too flirty mm. and we're canceling him, you yes. know? Um, in he's fact, very cancelable. <laughs> he's, he's, it hadn't occurred to me before you so said that. Like, so cancelable yeah. um, for, for reasons like way, way, way worse than flirting. Um, like, way worse. <laughs> but, but that's not how she feels about him. Like, she feels um, like devoted to him and uh like it's it, it's so so like not just affectionate like when i read through the book again in preparation for this very serious conversation <laughs> um i was really struck by that it's sort of I, I sort of un, like seeing it with my eyeballs instead of just listening it, to it with my ears i i felt like that um I don't know, I, I was sort of more interested in that relationship than I, like, or, or it seemed, not that I was more interested in it, but that it seemed like heavier in the book yeah. than I felt like it had been in my ears. Um, yeah, did you, like, I don't know, how did you think about their dynamic? Because it's so important in the book, and she, in order for sort of the, the, the plot to work, like, she, she has to... Um, like, I feel like there are points in the book where she could be like, fuck you. I said it, too. <laughs> um, yeah, but you said it in that chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, where she could have, like, sort of, like, walked away and, like, like, like sort of yeah. blocked, stopped things in their tracks. But I think because of her affection for him, she doesn't. Yeah. I'm so, that's a... Um, so glad you noticed that. <laughs> so I feel like there's a way that, the way I sort of describe it is that, you know, there's also this other character, Vadi, who's sort of, um, just to be incredibly reductive, is sort of the best friend character, and she's also uh, in cahoots with Clive. Um, and I feel like, I imagine them sort of like sitting at a bar and all facing, like they're friends, they're sitting at the bar, but they're facing him mm -hmm. together. So like, they all do things that they wouldn't normally do to or for each other for, for him. Um, I think it's because, you know, there's that work relationship, you know, there's a little bit about sort of the death of media in this book, um, and, but it's like that work relationship where he sort of raised her in some ways, which is different than like the shitty men and the meanies that, you know, it's not just like an abuse of power, like, and in some ways he's incredibly respectful of her. I mean, they're, they're doing all of this allegedly for her. So mm -hmm. it's, I think she goes through with it night after night after night after <laughs> night um because she's just she wants to see if it would work mm -hmm. you know what i mean it seems insane yeah um but like i think their relationship there's a part where she gets angry at him for you know he's now with um a woman <laughs> named chantal <laughs> who's like a wellness influencer person <laughs> who takes like a lot of pictures of like just her feet but you can tell like how like Modely, she is somehow <laughs> from, like her ankles, or like just like somehow like your ear. You're like, oh, that's like the ear of a model. <laughs> you don't know how. You can just tell. Um, and you know he has this relationship with her, and it's not like she's jealous of it. This is what I meant by the complexity of it. But I just what I like is that 
she's mad about the past. Like the whole point of the book is that she cannot let go of the past in all these different ways. And it doesn't just apply to the, you know, parade of boyfriends from age, you know, like 14 <laughs> and up. Um, it also applies to the fact that she's pissed that like when they almost like kissed once, she's like, it, it plays out a life, you know? It's mm -hmm. like a, so much of that, oh, if this had worked out, Maybe she could have made him a little calmer yeah. and less like of a megalomaniac. <laughs> and he could have made her a little less scatterbrained and they could be together yeah. in this other sort of alternate universe. And so much about the book is about the boats you don't get on or the boats you're pushed off of. Yeah. Um, and like learning to sort of let go of it. And yeah. so I think weirdly, even though it's so much about the boyfriends, um, again, when I think of what is the container of the book, it is a lot about their friendship yeah. and their relationship. Yeah. And I have to say, like, in terms of the boats that she doesn't get on in the boyfriend universe, um, they're pretty good boats. Some you know? Are okay boats. I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like... I'm so, like, defensive over her. I'm like, what are you saying? <laughs> no, no. I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, like, one of the things that I, that I enjoyed was that, like, when, when she encounters these people, it's not like, um, like it's not the like uh, revenge fantasy version of them. Like it's not like, oh no. god, this guy is like. If it is, those are the small ones. Those yeah, are, like the little like. Yeah, like the like the, the like the like, you know, real former relationships. Like it's, I don't know. I feel like, I felt like it was it was. Um, <laughs> It was a like a very realistic, um, like uh, you know, horrifying uh, psychological experiment. You know, yeah. where they they appear as like fully realized people who right. who are in the middle of their lives, and that it's not, um, yeah, I don't know, it's not like the <laughs> ghost of Christmas past, like no. Woo! Oh, well. I mean, Sorry. that was in the audiobook only. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's not. Although what's funny about it is it has this, like, a part of the impetus for the book, I think, was um, that kind when you see the ghost of Christmas past, you know, at some point, Clive, when she's about to embark upon this experiment, um, basically says, like, think of it like a Christmas carol. And she's like, yeah, by way of the exorcist. Like, yeah. Oh my God. Like, what? And I feel like, all of these things, not just in literature, but even just all of pop culture, are generally us trying to teach men a lesson. So it's like, oh my god, there's so many movies. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a Wonderful Life, Groundhog Day, uh, Turtle Sunshine, Spotless Mind, Her. It's always a dude yeah. who's like needs to become to like learn what's valuable <laughs> and like needs to become less of a jerk. Yeah. And, um, and like half the time it's Bill Murray. And half the time it's Bill Murray. Yeah. Or I feel like he's fine. Yeah. Like Bill Murray's fine. Let's focus on the ladies. Yeah. They, need, they need some mystical, like sort of speculative fiction. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's like, but they're not. But yeah, some of the men. I mean, I think I was very intentional with not wanting it to be. Um, I mean, you can probably also tell from the bit I met, you know, that that I read, where it like comes out of it eventually. Like, I basically, like, just went wild. I had so much fun. That, that You can probably tell from what I read that it used to be, like, 40 pages. <laughs> and then I'm like, all right. <laughs> because it just makes you, you know, I mean, I, this was maybe you were asking before about fiction versus nonfiction. And maybe one of the lessons from nonfiction or narrative nonfiction is be the hardest on yourself. Yeah. You know, be the hardest on yourself. Like, don't, um, it keeps you from writing, like, revenge fantasies mm -hmm. or you know just like a, like a bitterness porn or whatever yeah. like that yeah. and like I think that there is a great deal of affection that she has for these exes um that some of them aren't even exes yeah. um and they were just fun to um since inevitably everybody asks me this like sure there's some qualities from real life <laughs> <laughs> okay. but like I most, was not going to ask you I that mean, Sloan. somebody will oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it just but it's but it's they're so genuinely the stuff is so much fun to make up yeah it was so much fun to make them real people um and to sort of play with them like dolls which is what it feels like <laughs> when you have 
the kind of novel where characters are being introduced, yeah. which can yeah. be kind of scary. Like I, the example, recent examples I read were um, The Sea, The Sea, The Iris Murdoch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, Loitering with Intent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where it's just like, but it, you know, yeah. these characters, it's like, okay, well, how are you going to do that to a reader so they don't feel robbed when those yeah. people go away? Yeah, yeah. Um, but so that's why I, I needed to make them like a little nice. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay, so what, one thing that occurred to me in thinking about the book is that both, like, so this book is 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 both about um, like a work work life. Yes, and dating mm -hmm. and I think both of those spheres have changed enormously in the last let's just say <laughs> two to three years <laughs> why <laughs> but, it, but in addition to that um like the on top of that period of time um also the magazine industry has changed enormously like in the decade leading up to that and so has dating you know that like we're we're not in the same place like if you were someone who you know had dated in you know the year 2000 mm -hmm. like you wouldn't you wouldn't know any like i don't know like it, the, yeah. it just everything is so 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 different and i was wondering like well there's a common culprit right <laughs> Capitalism, the internet. The internet. Capitalism. Seems like a good target. Carbon emissions. But so I, I was wondering, like, because so the 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 dating in this book, like, I mean, and maybe 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 I'm wrong, but I feel like it is like it did feel like nicely removed from the internet mm. um which i enjoyed like in part because this book i should read emma's book <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's very removed from the internet yeah it's <laughs> very removed from the internet but but in part because like you know and i mean I'm not gonna plug my book too, but I will say <laughs> that I too wrote a book. Um, New York Times best um, in, in, in the in the pandemic, and and was really interested in not being in my current moment, mm. and so I was I was wondering if that was like part of part of what propelled you also like let me get out of here um well two things one is i would say there's not that much internet in it because it's so skewering of instagram and, and sort of tech culture wellness culture all these things that like it's fine they're on their phones i mean it's easy it's easy so i feel like movies have a harder time doing it mm -hmm. um putting you know visually watching someone talk on their phone mm -hmm. is very boring yeah um, but you can just write it and it's fine yeah you know um but so it was always a little bit removed because it's also about the past, do you know? It's about like when, she, when there are all these sort of like, you know, when she goes back and it has these flashbacks with these people, they are in years with no cell phones. Um, but no, weirdly, uh, super, I did not want to be in my current moment, but I had no choice with this because I handed it in the first draft um, March 9th, 2020. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How'd that go? <laughs> we were like, oh, well, because we were God. like, we're like oh. okay. <laughs> I'm like, I have this novel. Do I put, I remember asking my editor, I was like, do I put masks on everyone like they did with the lions outside the library? <laughs> so stupid. Sorry, I love the library, but honestly, yeah. it was like, I was so like, I remember looking out at the Statue of Liberty and being like, she, she's socially distanced. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to humiliate her. It's just like weird, cutesy, global pandemic fashion. <laughs> like, um, but no, yeah, none of it. So, so we didn't, so actually I didn't know. So, like, the idea that this takes place in a world that, you know, uh, in a very positive way, there's been a lot of, uh, much ado about the sort of New York, New York nostalgia yeah. and stuff like that. And I'm like, 
I didn't know. <laughs> like, there was nothing coming. Like, I maybe, I remember being online with the Whitney at some point and people being like, I couldn't find hand sanitizer today. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. I remember certain moments, but no, this was not um, that time period. So weirdly, I told um, a friend in an interview actually the other day, uh, I was like, no, this is like a last one out, turn off the lights yeah. novel. Yeah. And I actually thought there was going to be a bunch of me. Yeah. Weirdly, you are, but by, by, but more intentionally. Like, in other words, you were in the pandemic and then wrote about the 90s, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas, like, I feel like I did it by accident. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just didn't know. So yeah. there's no, like, oh, you know, because, I mean, the whole book is based on people running into each other. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's amazing because, I'm like, I feel like that, it, I mean, I guess that also just proves how much like, how much of the reading experience is the reader, you know? Yeah. Like, that, like, that, oh, like, no. I, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> I'll never have anything to say. <laughs> um, that, like, how much of the, how much of the reading experience the reader yeah. is bringing to it. And so, of course, oh. in my 2022 eyes and ears, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, Sloan felt just like me. <laughs> <laughs> I did, but my response was different. It is true, it is the reader. Like, I always say, um, you know, I remember being on, a, I was on a panel um, in Miami once with Lauren Groff, and there was a woman who was just sort of like asking about, it was during Fates and Furies time, and she was asking, she was like a little combative kind of, and eventually like Lauren sort of stopped explaining what she meant, and she was just like, I, it doesn't belong to me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> if you think that this happened in the book, if this is your interpretation, then this is correct. Yeah. You know, after a while, I'm out. Yeah. I've said my piece, yeah. you know, and they find it and they yeah. sell it and yeah. that's it. Yeah. But I feel like, no, my reaction to the pandemic was to actually write, um, the next thing I'm working on is a nonfiction book um, about... Gasps, <laughs> literal, <laughs> audible <laughs> gasps. Oh, don't do that. Because <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> it's about grief mm -hmm. and yeah, um, different sorts of death, but in a fun way. <laughs> and, um, and, um, uh, but I, what's weird about it is like my thing, it's weird because like basically I didn't want to be in my apartment either mm -hmm. and um, but my reaction I think was to almost go further like the only way out is through mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as opposed to like the, the other, the escapism yeah, direction. Yeah. It's almost like when it's like winter and miserable and you're like, I'm going to read War and Peace. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. One thing I... Oh, sorry. I, no, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Okay, Molly was gonna start to make one more. Okay, no, she's waving at me. Okay, okay. I'm gonna do one more. Okay, so. Okay, um, New York City. Ah, oh, the fifth lady. <laughs> um, I just love it. I just love it. And there's the hilarious line in here that I tried to mark and then I couldn't find it again. And so I didn't. Uh, but that's like about um, that Lola is like talking about like why she broke up with this one boyfriend. And it's like, well, he lived in bed style, but she was <laughs> tired of going there. Um, like this is, a, this is a Manhattan book. It is. And I loved it. I loved I it. No, because, because it's funny. then it does seem like I wrote it during the pandemic. It does <laughs> seem that I'm like, oh yeah, it's so fancy here with our 600 square foot apartments <laughs> and like no outdoor space. Yeah, no, but I just, I just, I love, I love it. I, I, I this is not a question. This is more of a comment. More than a comment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, then, oh, yeah, well, you were saying, okay, yeah, there's, no, <laughs> what's funny is, okay, so I've just come, as, as you have as well, um, off a, a national book tour, so yeah. I'm like, my gosh, yeah. um, I'm just, like, going through um, a slideshow of, like, different kinds of, like, bloodstained carpets, and like, uh, <laughs> and, and versus the glamour, that, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of people have brought up the, the New York thing, but from a distance, right, because yeah. they're not, I mean, we're obviously yeah. in New York. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm like, I don't know, like, oh, but this it's not really a decision. I mean, it is a decision once you decide to set a book in New York. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's the only real decision I made. And then everything just sort of follows naturally because this is my home. Yeah. I don't have, like, a different one. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing with the dating stuff in the yeah. book, you know, where, like, um, you know, if, if that is what takes up the category of romance for this character... Yeah. New York is what takes up the category of setting and home yeah. for this thing. But I didn't yeah. think of it 
um, as that sort of New York-y, but it is actually really like, I mean, it's like street specific. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's like, what's so you curious. know. I love it. But yeah, it's a very, it's a very specific um, sort of love letter to it. But it doesn't, um, I don't think it's actually, it's literally just, it's not, um, Trashing of Brooklyn. It's trashing of bed <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's one little line. It's one little line. It's one little Sloan line. loves Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? I spend it. Everyone I know loves it. I just, I, I'm in a like weird bubble. I feel like I'm coming in from Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is here. Um, okay, um, I will stop now. Oh, if well, anyone we'll has questions, or more please. of a comment. Or more of a comment. Please direct all comments to Emma. She loves It's up to you, Sloan. Oh, you the, get to choose. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I really, really love the book. I loved the like chaos energy of thinking of all of them sitting around making a list of all of her lovers like, <laughs> from the prior. Um, and I thought it was really interesting the order that she met them in. Like it wasn't mm. chronological. It wasn't. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. Did you have like any strategic plan for that, or like lessons that she was trying to learn throughout? That's a great question. Should I repeat it? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I won't repeat the compliment part because it's <laughs> that's ridiculous. Do you want me to be your compliment? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, basically, you know, as she starts running into these um, gentlemen, um, the question is: Is there any sort of strategy, strategy in terms of lessons she learns about like the order? Because she's told in advance that there won't be a chronological order. It's not like you're going to start, you know, from you know summer camp and then <laughs> and move forward. Um, and that's part of, and that, so the decision to do that is less about the individual men than to like, as you put it, like the sort of chaotic energy of it, to like literally just like make her not know. Mm -hmm. Because if she knew the order, she could sort of prep in advance, <laughs> you know, about who she was going to see next and like really go back. And as she does in the portion I read, you know, really sort of think about, okay, everyone I've ever even like made out with. And, <laughs> um, but a lot of it is to sort of start getting her used to the fact that they show up and they cannot without ruining it, they cannot appear um, if they don't think about her as well. And so I think it's like that sort of shock about, you know, that you matter to other people too, which is, there's a lot in the book about closure and it's like, um, or what I personally think closure is, which is different than what every, all of your therapists think. <laughs> 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 closure is, I think that you should hold on to things like a dog with a bone and <laughs> healthy. So, you know. There's been a lot of people asking me about like, dating stuff, and I'm like, I am not as to well. You should not take this. Like, like, like dating advice from me. Horrible idea. But I think that but what happens is she has like a couple of big ones at first, mm -hmm. and then there's like a little one or so. And I think that's more of a choice. It was more of a narrative choice for the book rather than for like her as a character to just also get the reader alongside her used to the idea that it's going to sort of fluctuate. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. No, thank you. That's a good question. Oh, hi. I have a similar question. That's a good mess. <laughs> um, I'm curious so how did you build the um, constraints of the universe? Because there are so many absurd qualities to it, but it's also really tight. <laughs> like, thank I you. Want to know. Okay, so um, in terms of building the constraints of the universe and saying that it, you know it's sort of absurd or absurdist, um, but also tight at the same time. Um, okay, so it it is a sort of. Um, tight shot on a very specific area of New York. It takes place in the Lower East Side, it takes place in Chinatown. Um, and I feel like the weird part about it is, and I feel like a little crazy admitting this, um, I don't think it's that weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think any of it is that Same. weird. Same. It's weird, because even the publishing house will be like, oh, it has all these sort of like, I mean, magical realism has its own historical roots, so I won't really apply that, but it has this, oh, these like sort of absurdist or like qualities, and I'm like, where? <laughs> Show me. <laughs> because I genuinely think, you know, the whole thing is about it, these packages that this place is offering offer, you know, they cost a fortune. I think they're like $200,000 or $250,000. I can't remember. I think it, I think inflation from the, from, the from the galley to the finished book. I think it's like $250,000. Um, and the whole thing, that's the whole point of it. Um, and I, I think <clears throat> if you gave me like, if you got me like two people's Instagram passwords and gave me fifty dollars, I could put you in someone you don't want to see. Not a problem. Like, can you stop threatening me? I'm sorry. Apologies. But yeah, so the tightness I think 
comes, I mean, I don't mean to sound like this whole thing, but I think that this is weirdly the answer to your question. It comes sort of naturally because it's just like the North Star is me just like telling the story of this specific group of friends and this specific woman. And so nothing in there, as zany as it is, it all, much like the humor, I guess, lives in service um, to getting her through this gauntlet, mm -hmm. you know? More. Questions. Oh, yeah, more questions. Oh, hi. Hey, lady. Hi, lady. That's why she can tell us about some next one. So, actually, she can. I can. I can. Two, two things. First, Sloan came to visit my friend Janet and I down the street when we first moved here. And she was so impressed we had so much room in our apartment that we could block cabinet doors with a microwave. <laughs> Um, I do remember being yeah. impressed by them. Yeah. We had enough room in our kitchen. Yeah. Um, my question is a nerdy process question, and that is that you seem to be a person who has a wonderful social life being a Manhattanite, but you also have time to write books and also like to have your, your journalism part of your life. So tell us about your process for writing this book. Okay, so the process is, so I don't know if everyone heard, but it's hard with the math, that's why I'm repeating, not because you didn't. Yeah, project. <laughs> I've known her for a long time. She's always been a projector. <laughs> but the, yeah, the, the, you know, how does one uh, balance a social life uh, and then also a Manhattan, a Manhattan, a Manhattan. A Manhattan. A Manhattan <laughs> social life. Yeah. And then, yeah, the next, the next like, a Tokyo S <laughs> social life. And then, but then also, you know, work. Um, I would say. <laughs> Every part of me wants to be like, okay, no kidding. <laughs> uh, no. Your current writing life. <laughs> the follow up question is my current writing life. Um, no, I think that, you know, it's funny because I. I just think you, you end up being really selective about what you do, and I also don't do anything else. It was really hard. I used to work at Random House, and. Um, when I worked there and was writing books on the side and then also trying to like, befriend and maintain any friendships, um, that was sort of a, a nightmare. And I think the friendships were the first weak spot to go. Um, I think when you start feeling like the work is the weak spot, is like that's, that's the thing that is negotiable, then you're in, you're in deep trouble, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I feel like it's really hard, what's very hard to do Honestly, it's just, uh, it's still after, you know, five books, we both have, you know, five books and like Emma has, you know, tons of responsibilities with both of us, like, is just take yourself very seriously. Mm -hmm. Not in the way you speak to other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not in the be like, oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know why I'm Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> you know, but not, but in the way you, um, you're like this is my this is my job and this is actually a very good job <laughs> and I need to keep on showing up for it and so I think that's what's sort of difficult but I'll tell you it got real easy during the pandemic <laughs> you know like where it was just like I'm gonna meet you for a walk and like I kind of try to sometimes regain some of that I don't know about all of you but like there are a couple of things where I'm like I remember when, like going for a walk in the park was like all I needed mm -hmm. I found out what I needed in terms of like a tent pole or just like a little bit of like a a methadone of socialization. I'm very <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I just do you want to talk to us? Don't. About it? <laughs> Don't. Just drink them up. Bring them up. Yeah, that's so I don't know if that that's not like really a good answer, but I do yeah. think that um take yourself seriously. It's you take answer. yourself seriously about it and then I think that um I mean it helps that a lot of my friends are writers, I guess, or they moved out of town. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't really, I don't, so yeah, I don't have a full answer, but I do think that the, it just, it does balance itself out naturally if I feel like I'm not writing. Because then also, frankly, not only is it damaging to the work, I'm deeply unpleasant to be around, <laughs> you know, because I'm just like griping that I'm wherever I am, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yes, hello. Um, so Going into reading this book, or I haven't read it, um, That's okay. kind of blind um, until now. <laughs> so now I'm kind of surprised that it kind of sounds like a cross between weird work and Scott Pilgrim's ex girlfriends or something like Zadie. Oh, I've never read th is that, that those are books? It's a manga, but it's a movie also. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but I'm really excited, okay. and it sounds really different from anything that I've read of yours before. 
was that an intentional choice or did mm. it just kind of come out? Um, so it sounds really different from other things that she's read. Was it intentional or did it come out? I've, now I'm filibustering because I don't know the answer. So I'm just like, oh my God, I'm so not like a politician. <laughs> I'm so happy you asked that question. Let me kiss your baby. Like, <laughs> like, um, I think it just kind of came out. I mean, I do think, like, I, I touched a little bit about on um, the sort of avoidance factor of it, uh, that I had been sort of avoiding certain themes and certain topics, um, and then just sort of needed a sort of way in. And then once I had it, I mean, I think also, you know, the first book, the first novel, The Class, um, I personally think it actually shares an interesting amount of DNA. Inter I think it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not really for me to say. Um, a, a, a DNA with this one and the fact that, like, you have these people that are just sort of sitting around in sort of a comedy of manners fashion, mm -hmm. which I can do. I feel confident in my ability to do that. Um, and then there's sort of this sort of uh, kind of twisted wish fulfillment. Um, I'm looking at you in that hard because you can't see me anymore. Um, but there's like a, a twisted sort of... Hi. <laughs> oh, sorry, sir. Um, but yeah, there's like a, a twisted sort of wish fulfillment in a way um, where like, okay, you guys are so sick of your lives, or, you know, and in the class, but it's very much like the friendship. Like you're so sick of your lives, they're not going forward, they're in their 20s. And one of the characters goes on this like crazed hunt for a necklace that he's convinced exists, like this like, you know, ancient thing basically. Um, and in this one, it's like more the love life that gets addressed mm -hmm. and more like, okay, well, like, and you're, you're, you're sort of uncertain about your fiance, you know, you're, she's uncertain about her life and moving forward with it. Um, let's, let's give her some like sort of <laughs> mystical intervention <laughs> and see what happens. Sounds like I hate her. I don't <laughs> like, I was like playing with her, but I just, you know, I just sort of wanted to teach her like a really elaborate lesson, which is hopefully entertaining. Yes. Yeah. It is very entertaining. Everyone, please give Sloan a huge round of applause. And so we're going to park Sloan down at the desk mm -hmm. toward the back door, and she will sign your books. And you should buy four copies <laughs> for all of your friends. They're all different on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true. You should, yeah. Read them all. Yeah, tell me you can spot the you differences. Yeah, you circle the differences <laughs> and then you send your findings to Slam. Yeah. And then you're in her cult. <laughs> That's what happens. And then you just send them all dramatic <laughs> um, Anything else? Small yeah. Molly. Live stream. Oh, live stream. Oh, Thank hi. you. <laughs> we forgot about you. you can Thanks for coming. And you can click on a link. Yes, in the description. In the description. And then you can buy it. Yeah. And, and someone will wave at you right now. <laughs> you can't make it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you.